and good evening. Welcome to Wednesday in the Word. Pastor Kevin here with you once again on this Wednesday evening, and this is Wednesday in the Word for September the 18th, 2024. Glad to be here with you again uh, this week, and I uh, pray that this finds you and yours doing well and enjoying the blessings of the Lord. So uh, I think we have a lot of good material. We, of course, started a new series last week. We'll talk more about that in a bit. But um, we're going to open with the word of prayer before we get into the word. Now, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We just believe tonight that you will guide and direct us in this word, cause understanding to come. Open this word to us. This is your words. We, we approach it reverently. We approach it carefully and expectantly. We expect to behold wondrous things out of thy law. And Lord, we believe that this word is your holy, God-breathed word written by men who were moved along by the Holy Ghost. And so we believe you for the Holy Ghost, who is our teacher, who abides within, to guide and direct this time in the word. Bless your people who partake of this live session. Bless those who pick it up later and those who, uh, well, pick it up later or share it or, you know, whatever the case. Lord, we just pray your blessing upon each one in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. We want to uh, welcome each one. We've got a couple, uh, two or three that have joined us uh, right now, and we know there will probably be others who will. And so, get that hair off of my head there. Not off my head, but out of my face. Amen. All right, praise the Lord. All right, well, um, we are tonight, you know, last week we started a new series that we've entitled Creation, the Age of the Earth and the World Before Adam and Eve. This happens to be part two, again, of Creation, the Age of the Earth and the World Before Adam and Eve. Now, that title alone, I know, can ruffle some feathers. And I assure you that as we, you know, use that colloquial expression, that ruffling feathers is not my motivation for bringing this teaching. I am not out to upset or offend anyone or alienate anyone for that matter. But I do believe that we need to teach what I believe the Word of God reveals to us. Now, a lot of people, when it comes to a subject like this, are very, um, they are very um, emotionally attached, shall we say, to what they believe. Because they were taught a certain way from maybe a young age, maybe a grandmother, maybe a, a dear Sunday school teacher, maybe a mother or father taught them a certain way, a certain belief a certain way of viewing things in Scripture, and then someone comes along that challenges that, yes, people can have an emotional response to that, but again, that is not my motivation for teaching these things. I believe, and again, like we said last time, this, what you believe, what you believe about these issues, about these matters, Praise the Lord. I'm trying to get that hair out of my face there. There we go. Amen. Anyway, it was irritating me. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be distracting there. But at any rate, you know, um, but really what you believe about these matters, and I'm talking about the age of the earth, whether you believe in a young earth or whether you believe like me in an old earth, it does not affect your salvation. You know, whether or not you are born again does not depend upon what you believe about the age of the earth. Amen. Nor is it the basis of our fellowship. You know, I have a lot of brethren who teach differently on this than I do. In fact, I would say, I would dare say, the vast majority of the evangelical world would adhere to the teaching of young earth creationism. So obviously, I have a lot of brethren 
who would hold to a young earth. Now, as I said last time, really the entirety of the church world, believers, fall into one of two camps when it comes to a topic like this. You either have young earth creationists or you have old earth creationists. Now to give a very simplified definition of both, young earth creationists believe that the age of the earth is 6,000 at the most 7,000 years old. Okay, Old earth creationists believe that the earth itself, now this really merits some explanation, but I'm just going to say it out this way. Um, and that is that old earth creationists believe that the earth could be millions, if not billions, of years old. So that's a very simplified definition of the two positions. Young earth creationists, old earth creationists. And to start this week also, I want to reiterate something we said last time as well. First of all, all Bible-believing Christians believe in special creation. Now, we need to make sure we understand what I'm saying. I'm very carefully choosing my terminology. I said all Bible-believing Christians, that is, Christians who believe in the literal inspiration, inerrancy, infallibility of Scripture, Christians who believe that the Bible is the God-breathed Word of God, written by holy men of old as they were moved along by the Holy Ghost. All right, that is a Bible-believing Christian as I am defining it here. So all Bible-believing Christians believe in special creation. Not only that, all Bible-believing Christians believe that Elohim, the God of the Bible revealed in Genesis 1, is the creator of all things. Not only that, all Bible-believing Christians reject the theory of Darwinian evolution. Now, I'm not going to get into discussing, like we did last time, theistic evolution, which some unfortunately, in the old earth camp, which I would consider myself to be a part of, um, unfortunately, some of them have embraced the notion of theistic evolution. I do not accept that, nor do I accept, and we'll really say more about this, but nor do I accept the notion that some of my old earth brethren believe, and that is what's known as the day-age theory. In other words, that the days of Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 and following, the six days of creation, could represent, in that teaching, day-age theory, could represent an age. And so, rather than it being a literal 24-hour solar day by Hebraic reckoning, or how Hebrew-speaking people would think of it, um, it could represent an age, a long period of time. I don't, I don't accept that, okay? So, and I point that out because it's important to understand that not everyone in the, either the young earth or the old earth camps teach exactly the same thing. Now, I think without a doubt, the young earth camp, they would be more closely aligned in what they teach than some of the my old earth brethren because there are some varieties in old earth creationism, things that are believed. For example, um, the ministry headed up by Hugh Ross, who is a brilliant man, a scientist, reasons to believe RTB, they are an old earth creation uh, group, but they support what is known as the Big Bang Theory. Now, I don't accept the Big Bang Theory. They also believe in day-age theory. I don't accept that. So there are, there are differences in the belief systems or, or what you know people in these individual camps believe. But anyway, uh, I, don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But when it comes to discussing creation and the age of the earth 
it's important to understand when day one occurred. Now, remember, we said that we believe the events of Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 through verse 31 occurred over six literal 24-hour solar days. Okay, so I believe beginning at verse 3 of Genesis 1 and then going through those six days of creation, day 1, day 2, day 3, and so forth, they represent six literal 24-hour solar days. And we'll explain more about that terminology. So, there are two options as to when day one of creation occurred. Number one, we can say that day one occurred at Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Day one was right there, we could say. Or, day one occurred at Genesis 1-3. Those really are the two options. Now, if day one occurred at Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, you know, and the earth was without form, verse 2, and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the water, so on. If day one occurred there, we have an argument for a young earth. Because God created the earth in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. And then he created the earth by that way of thinking. He created the earth in void. It was void. It was dark. It was water covered. It was a chaotic wasteland, as that you know Hebrew phrase, tohu vabohu, uh, explains. You know, it was it was void and it was it was void and darkness covered the face of the deep. You know, if indeed day one occurred there, God created the earth, he created it in in chaos, and then he began to order it. Now, there are, I want to submit to you, let me, let me back up and say this real quick, because I just happened to think of this. I don't say this to disparage my new earth, or young earth, pardon me, not new earth, young earth brethren. I want to preface with this, with that rather. I don't say this to disparage my young earth brethren. I only put it out here for thinking, to stir the old gray matter, as as it were. But if you think about it, young earth creationists, if indeed God created the he- the earth, in chaos, if he indeed did that, well, that's more in keeping with evolutionary thinking than anything. Why do you say that? Because in evolution, we have order coming out of chaos. Well, that's exactly the position of my young earth brethren. If we make day one on Genesis Genesis 1-1, they would believe that order came out of chaos. Well, that's what the evolutionists believe. Whereas, old earth creationists believe that God created the earth originally perfect, it became chaotic, and then he reordered it beginning at Genesis 1-3. Okay, I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, but there is a real problem. I say problem singular. There are really problems with day one occurring at Genesis 1-1, not the least of which is the text itself, okay? The six days of creation, beginning at Genesis 1-3, and really, I submit to you re-creation, and we'll explain that as we go on. I believe that what we are really seeing beginning at Genesis 1-3 is re-creation, reordering. But anyway, I, I digress, and we will we will talk more about that. But I believe that the six days of creation, or if you will, recreation, are framed with the same terminology at the beginning and end of each day. And we'll look at this in a moment. But I want you to notice, and we when we examine this, that each day 
is defined as beginning with evening and ending with morning. This is not how we view it in the West, so this sounds odd to us, to be honest. This is Hebraic or Eastern thinking. In this culture, that is the Eastern or Hebraic culture, even, uh, evening is twilight, or literally as twilight means between the lights, as the sun sets below the horizon. Now we know scientifically the sun does not literally set. We understand that, but just how we think about it, okay? So twilight occurs as the sun sets below the horizon and morning as the first light peaks over the horizon, making one full solar day. And we'll say more about this. What is our problem with all this, though? Well, one of the big problems is that we view the Bible, which is an Eastern book, through Western eyes. All right? I want to say that again. We view the Bible, which is an Eastern book, through Western eyes, which is why we miss some things, not the least of which is when it comes to creation and the age of the earth. I want to submit to you that day one of the Genesis creation account is not in verses one or two. In fact, these verses don't even describe the work done by Almighty God during the specified six days of activity in making and forming the world. Why is that? Well, first, and, and, and there are several reasons, and we're not going to get to them all tonight because I'll pick some of this up and we'll look at some other things. But first of all, the reason for that is the text itself. Now, if we give a straightforward literal reading to the text itself of Genesis 1, it becomes clear that what occurred in verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1 are separate events than what occurred in verses 3 through 31. Amen. What do we see in Genesis 1-1? Well, let's go there. Go to Genesis 1-1 again, if you have your Bibles. I hope you do. Amen. And by the way, I wanted to say this too, I forgot to earlier, and that is this particular teaching is not a teaching I would bring on a typical Sunday morning. Okay? Why? Well, because on Sunday morning, you have people who are at various levels of spiritual growth and development. Some are very young in the Lord. Some are more mature in the Lord. Some are very seasoned in the things of God. Some are very new to the things of God. You have a variety of people. And not only that, to be perfectly plain, you have a variety of motivations in people being at church on a given Sunday morning. You know, they have various motivations for being there. And the least of which, I want to tell you, is typically a hunger to hear the Word of God. That's usually on the lower end of the proverbial spectrum, okay, on a Sunday morning, typically. Now, if you have a group of people who will come together in a virtual setting like this on a Wednesday evening or pick it up even later and watch the rebroadcast, you have a group of people who are doing that really out of a motivation of being hungry for the deep things of the Word. And that's why I teach these types of things in our Wednesday sessions and not in a typical Sunday morning, okay? Just so you, you know, all right? Praise the Lord. Okay, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, in the beginning there, that whole phrase, in the beginning, those three words in English come from the Hebrew reshith, reshith. 
And Reshith in the Old Testament refers to a preliminary period than the first in a series of events. In English, we might refer to this as the primordial period, or in other words, what occurred first in the beginning is set apart from what occurs going forward. E.W. Uh, Bullinger, the, the editor of the Bullinger Bible, or probably better known as the Companion Bible, a great study Bible, uh, E.W. E. Bullinger links this in the beginning to what Peter referred to as the world that then was. In 1 Peter 3, 5, and 6, he goes on to say, creation in eternity past, to which all fossils and remains belong. Now that's important. Why? Because my new earth brethren, or younger, I keep saying new earth, my young earth brethren, they will put dinosaurs and what we typically refer to as the prehistoric age, they'll put that together with man about six or 7,000 years ago. In fact, if you go to the Creation Museum and the Ark Experience in Kentucky, and I, I applaud what those brethren have done out there, but you will go to that exhibit and go through the ark and you will see them depicting a species of dinosaur as having been on the ark. But I submit to you that what we refer to as the prehistoric age, the time of the dinosaurs, the various um, you know, ages of the dinosaurs and all of that prehistoric things occurred <laughs> at an unspecified period between in the beginning and God create God reordering the earth beginning in verse 3 it's in that period of time that we re see revealed in verse 2 and we'll try to clarify that as we go but i just wanted to put that out there right now we do not know and i say this without fear of contradiction we do not know how long ago the beginning was. This Hebrew word, reshith, describes the very first or the very beginning. It speaks of the origin of something, in this case, the beginning or origin of God's creative acts, and we'll examine this in more detail, but it is certain I submit to you that day one of the six days of creation described in Genesis 1 did not occur in verse 1. Well, why? The text itself, what it says. Secondly, because of light. Now, again, there, we're going to have several of these. We're not going to get them all tonight, but we're going to have several of these. But secondly, because of light, or the lack thereof. There cannot be, listen to me now, the existence of a biblical solar day without the existence of light. Now, this is a quote from a book by Jack W. Langford entitled, The Gap is Not a Theory. Okay, we know what he believes. All right, he says, quote, there must be, first exists light for a full 24 hours as the earth is in rotation in order to have a solar day according to the Hebrew reckoning. Anything else is both unbiblical and most certainly unscientific. That's Langford. All right. One thing he goes on here, one thing that is clear is that there was no such light in existence in the account of verse 2. In verse 2, the earth is shrouded by a total blackout. Light was not brought into existence until verse 3, when God spoke it into existence. All right, and that's J.W. Langford, The Gap is Not a Theory, page 25, Kindle edition. 
All right, Langford goes on to say, I have one more quote from him. Quote, when the Hebrew scriptures speak of the first day in this manner, there was evening, praise the Lord. Someone was trying to call on my phone. I've got to go back to here. Praise the Lord. All right. I, you know, I forgot that calls, I set my phone over there, but I forgot that calls could come in on the Mac here. So anyway, pardon me for that. If you happen to hear that come across anyway. All right. Quoting here, when the scripture, Hebrew scriptures speak of the first day in this manner, there was evening and there was morning day one. It means that according to the Hebrew uh, reckoning of a day, the evening commenced the first solar day, which led into the first 24 hours of night, and the morning led into the first 12 hours of daylight, in order to constitute one full 24-hour day, hence the first day. These scriptures state clearly that each and every one of the six days began exactly in the same manner, namely with the evening, uh, with the evening rather. The first day was no different than the last, and the last was no different than the first. All six days began precisely the same, with the evening, twilight, light had to exist continuously in order for all six days to be constituted as literal solar days according to the Hebrew reckoning. And again, that was Jack W. Langford. The gap is not a theory, page 25. Okay. So as not to get too bogged down with technicalities, let's look at what God, Elohim, God's name in relationship to his creation, let's look at what he did at the beginning or origin of his creative acts. The text says, now again, the text says, looking at what the Bible actually says, in the beginning, God created. God created. This is the Hebrew bara, and bara is to create something brand new with the understanding being, by the way, to create out of nothing. So when God began creating, it was a brand new thing that had never existed before. Now this will become especially important to our understanding as we look farther into this because we're really going to dig into some of the word studies in the six days of creation. We're going to get into that. So the understanding what bara means in comparison to other things that we're going to see in that a creation account will become very important. Okay, but what did he originally create? Well, he created the heavens. That is Shemayim, Shemayim in the Hebrew. And in Hebrew, that word is always plural. I know our King James Version translates it singular, but that word Shemayim is always in the plural. Okay, heavens. All right. It is... And it describes, by the way, the three levels of heaven. You know, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the flesh or out of the flesh, God knows. But such an one, he says, was, cre was caught up to the third heaven and saw unspeakable words that it is not lawful for a man to utter. Okay, the third heaven, he said, though, so, if there's a third heaven, there'd have to be a first and a second, right? Now, I know in some of our, some of our Jewish friends, they teach seven levels of heaven. I'm not going to get into that. But we know from the Bible, there are at least three levels of heaven, okay? There is, first of all, the atmosphere. That's the sky above us where the birds fly. Then there is the starry heavens or the universe, and then there is, a, is heaven, 
as the abode of God. Now, we, we know then that when God created his original initial creation, he created the heavens, plural, Shemayim, and he created the earth, which, which is Eretz. Eretz is earth. This describes the earth or it describes land. And by making a comparison of Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-10, it becomes obvious, I submit to you, and this is important, so hear me, it becomes obvious that earth and dry land are synonymous. So when God created the heaven, Shemayim, and the earth, Eretz, he created dry land. Because the earth and dry land are synonymous. Now, I know we were in a Bible study one time many years ago. And I'd just begun to see some of these things in the Word. And we, uh, Joyce Ann and I, mentioned that observation that the earth describes dry land. And somebody spoke up and they said, yeah, but it also describes this planet. Okay. But again, in looking at what the text says, in the beginning, God created the heaven, Shemayim, and the earth, Eretz. And it, again, it is synonymous. If you keep it in context to what it says there, it is synonymous with earth or dry land. Okay, I don't want to belabor that point. But anyway... The earth, I want to say to you, was originally created, listen to me, originally created dry land. Okay. Now, all right. Here we go. Thank you, Jesus. Because we got some more interesting stuff to say about this. But here is an interesting little aside. I just thought this would be interesting to throw in there. You don't see what I'm about to tell you in our English translations. It just isn't there because it wasn't translated, okay? But what I'm going to say to you is this. You don't see this in our English translations, but it is in the Hebrew text. In the Hebrew, and this is really scattered throughout the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, is the particle et. Now, if you're going to spell that out in Romanized letters, it would be E-T-H, et, and it is made of the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and I know, I know I did not mispronounce it, I didn't say alphabet, I know, I said alphabet because that's what you call the Hebrew alphabet, okay? So, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet is, well, Aleph. <laughs> Aleph. And the last letter is Tav. Now, we could get into discussing, you know, the ancient forms of it and how in the ancient Hebrew there were pictured pictographs and how it told the story. I'm not going to take the time. Sometime doing a study on the Hebrew language might be interesting, but we're not doing that right now. But what I want you to know is this little particle I'm talking about, et, made up of aleph and tav, and it, 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 when those two letters are put together, because you read Hebrew right to left, it forms the sound et. Okay. Now, this little particle is untranslated, and scholars tell us that it was never intended to be translated. But what it conveys to us, I believe and submit to you, is remarkable. It appears in verse 1, between the heavens and the earth. It would be like this. In the beginning, God created et the heavens and et the earth. So what does this little particle describe? 
it would be like saying in the beginning God created everything in the heavens and everything in the earth. Now the teaching of the Aleph Tav really merits a teaching all its own. But for our purposes here, let's think about it in terms of creation, shall we? Revelation chapter 1.8, you're probably familiar with this, but Revelation 1.8 says Jesus is speaking. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, here's what I want you to think about. Even though the New Testament, and we have pointed this out before, even though the New Testament was originally written in Koine Greek or the common Greek of the day, the Greek language that the common man, the common people spoke, Koine Greek. Okay, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, but I don't believe Jesus would have spoken Greek to John on Patmos, but he would have, I submit to you, spoken Hebrew. You recall when he appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, the Bible says that he spoke in the Hebrew tongue. So, I submit to you that since Jesus has returned to the Father's right hand, he speaks now what is considered the language of God, the language of heaven, the perfect language, which is believed to be the Hebrew language, okay? Interesting little side note there. Before English became the official language of the United States, the early colonists, they were so uh, in line with Old Testament or Hebraic thinking that the language of the United, what would become the United States was originally going to be Hebrew. Well, isn't that interesting? I think so anyway. All right, anyway, that's a little side note there, but watch this. But I don't believe that Jesus would have spoken uh, Greek to John on Patmos. I believe he would have spoken Hebrew, and in Hebrew, he would have said, I am the Aleph, and I am the Tav, or in English, or I am the A and the Z and everything in between. This phrase, by the way, I am the Aleph and the Tav, is a very, was anyway, a very popular rabbinic idiom that was used to represent from the beginning of something to the end of something, and everything in between. You would say, the Aleph and the Tav. All right. Now, something else. There's more. This is like an infomercial, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Even though this little particle is scattered, talking about et, is scattered throughout the Old Testament in the Hebrew New Testament. There is a Hebrew New Testament, by the way, um, that um, the Hebrew, um, there was a Hebrew New Testament published, and I actually have a copy of it. And in the Hebrew New Testament, watch this, this little particle, et, appears 22 times. Well, Someone says, so? Well, it just so happens that the alphabet, the out of which comes all the word of God, out of which all the word of God comes, out of which all the word of God comes, contains 22 letters. Now listen to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This is the A part of, of verse 3, but it says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. I, and I, this is bold. I bolden this in my notes 
through whom also he made the worlds. Through whom? His Son. All right. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. And by that word, beloved, indicated by these 22 letters in Messiah, Yeshua Jesus, he upholds the universe that he created. It would not be a surprise to me at all if every instance of the Aleph Tav was a marker, a sign of Messiah in the Hebrew text. He appears through it all. Wow. Okay. That was an aside. We threw that in free of charge, okay? That, that is included in your admission cost tonight, that little bit. All right, let me get a quick drink. Just kidding, you didn't pay an admission, you know that. All right. Anyway, back to verse 2 of Genesis. What does it say? Now we know verse 1 said, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Watch verse 2, though. It says, The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of of the waters. All right, so that word, now we said this last week as well, but we're re reiterating, that word translated was, is the Hebrew haya. Haya. I love saying that one because it's kind of cool, but it's haya. And it is, means, became. It is translated, now I know this gets a little technical, so stay with me, but it is translated became 67 times in the scriptures, in the Old Testament. Hayah. Okay, now I, I give a few of the scriptures in the notes here. It is translated becamest several times. Came and came to pass, it is translated 505 times become 66 times, come to pass, haya is translated 131 times, and be in the sense of become uh, in several more passages and also here in Genesis 1-2. But what did it, what was the state of it? What did it become? Well, it says without form and void. Now, we said that that's that little Hebrew phrase. It's kind of a play on words, but it is tohu va bohu. Tohu va bohu, and it is waste and empty, as it says in Hebrews, or pardon me, Jeremiah 4.23, and we found out that the earth was not created tohu, waste, in the beginning, we saw that in Isaiah 45, 18, God said, I am the creator of earth, heavens and the earth, and I did not create it in vain. Tohu. He says, I did not create it that way. Okay? The earth was not created, tohu, in the beginning, according to Isaiah 45, 18, but it became formless and void this way. It became this way. And I want to suggest to you, because of sin. Now, okay, if it was because of sin, whose sin? I want to suggest to you that it was the fall of Lucifer. His rebellion against the throne of God in eternity past that brought judgment upon the original creation described in Genesis 1-1, resulting in the chaos and darkness of Genesis 1-2. Now, some would argue, this is impossible that there was sin prior to Adam and Eve. Why? 
Because doesn't Romans 5.12 say, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So it is clear from the context of what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 5, it is clear from the context that the one man described is Adam. So, both sin and death, according to Romans 5.12, entered the world through one man being Adam. So, how could there be sin and death before Adam, as I am suggesting there, there was? That is assuming, beloved, that there has always been one world, that is, one cosmos, or one created order. What if there was a world, what if there was a created order or society before Adam? Now, one thing we know for certain, okay, is that Lucifer, which I understand is not his proper name. Lucifer, as we read in the King James Version, came over from um, the Latin Vulgate translated by Jerome. It was the, it was the Latin translation of the, of the Greek, uh, Hebrew and Greek, okay? It was the Latin translation. It became the Latin Vulgate and in the Latin Vulgate, uh, Jerome used the word, the name Lucifer. It got picked up by the King James translators, and that's why we read Lucifer in Isaiah 14. But it's not his proper Hebrew name. But one thing we know for certain is that Lucifer, again, not his proper name, rebelled and fell before we find the serpent in the wilderness or in, in the garden, pardon me, not the wilderness, in the garden in Genesis 3. His fall is described, by the way, we're not going to go there right now, but his fall is described in detail in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 19, and his pre-fall state can be seen in Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19. Not only that, we know from the imagery in Revelation 12 and th uh, 12 verses 3 and 4 that a third of the stars or angels followed him in his act of high treason against the throne of God. Now, I want to submit to you for your thinking, for your consideration. I want to submit to you that Lucifer had a kingdom over which he ruled, and that kingdom was likely on the earth. It was certainly below the throne of God, because in his rebellion, he said, I will ascend into heaven to the throne of God. We know that it was below the throne of God, and I submit to you, it was on this earth. He probably, and most definitely, had angels that were under him and his subjects, oh, button, back, buckle your seatbelt right here, and his subjects, which over which he ruled, were likely a race of pre-Adamite beings. Pre-Adamite beings. I did not say they were humans. Now, we're going to get into this a bit later. I don't have time to do it tonight. But they were beings of some order. Okay. Now, stay with me. I know this is wading out in some deep water. We know from what we read in Isaiah 45, 18, we read it last time, that God did not create the earth in vain, that is, he did not create it tohu, but he created it to be inhabited, and it was inhabited before the flood of Genesis 1-2 and the work of the six days of Adam's time. 
When you read of that in Genesis 1-3, Genesis 2-25, Isaiah 14-12-14, Jeremiah 4-23-26, Ezekiel 28-11-17, 2 Peter 3-5-7, and of course, Genesis 1-2. Wait, someone says. Pastor, did I hear you say the flood of Genesis 1-2? Yes, that's what I said. The flood of Genesis 1-2. Oh, what? Wait a minute. The flood didn't occur until Genesis 7, right? Yes, that was Noah's flood. The flood in Noah's time. The flood of Genesis 1-2, I want to submit to you, was something we could refer to as Lucifer's flood. It was not the same event as Noah's flood, and it explains, I submit to you, the chaotic wasteland, water-covered earth revealed in Genesis 1-2. And we're not going to do it tonight because of time, but maybe next time, there are 20 different comparisons, 20 different contrasts, between this event that I'm calling Lucifer's flood and Noah's flood, there are 20 different uh, contrasts that we can give you between what I'm submitting to you are those two events. But I submit to you that Genesis 1-2 is a picture of judgment on the world that then was spoken of in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, and Lord willing, we will look farther at this next time. Whew! My goodness. All right, I purposely leave some time at the end. If anyone has questions, if you have comments, please chat those in right now. This is why I leave some time at the end. If you have something that you want to add, that you want to ask, don't not, and it's probably a double negative, but don't hesitate to ask it, okay? If there's something you would say, hey, you know, pastor, I don't quite understand you know, what you're saying about this, or I need some clarification of this, or I've thought this way. You know, if you have something, put it in there. While you're thinking two things, I'm going to get a quick drink. My throat gets a little dry. And I'm going to tell you about our church service Sunday morning. Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, we meet on the corner of 1st or 21st in Crawford, 2028 Crawford, right here in Boone on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We are located right across the street from Franklin School. It's a good landmark, okay? But it's right in the corner, 21st and uh, 21st in Crawford, 2028 Crawford is our physical address. But we'd love to have you come and join us in a live service anytime you can. Now, for most that join us on Sunday morning or that join us on Wednesday evening, that is not a possibility. So for you folks, that is why we live stream the service, the same place you get this study on Wednesday evening. You can get our live service on Sunday. And we invite you, by the way, to tune in to that. And let me say this. We would very much appreciate it if you would always share our videos. If you think we have something to say that is worth sharing, worth hearing, well, we ask that you would share the videos. They're very easy to do. There's a share arrow right there on Facebook. Just share that with your timeline, with your contacts, whatever the case. Hey, we would greatly appreciate it. That's how you uh, grow it. Brother Bob, by the way, and I was going to go back here. Now, Brother, I'll get to your um, question here in a minute or your statement. Um, greetings there to our sister Lynn. Uh, good evening to Brother Vince. 
Uh, good evening to Sister Diane and Brother John. Good evening to Brother Bob and Sister Pat. Good evening to Sister Nancy. Okay, Brother Bob says, The Genesis Flood, John Whitcomb and Henry Morris, a heavy read, the biblical record, and the scientific implications. Yes, um, I have... I have... Um, I, I have read, it's been many years ago, I have it somewhere in my library, I have the Genesis Flood by uh, John Whitcomb and Henry Morris, and uh, I. it's been a long time since I read that. If I'm remembering correctly, those brothers are uh, would be uh, considered in the young earth uh, category, and I love those guys. Uh, but uh, yes, that is that is a real, it is a very heavy read. You are correct, my brother, very heavy. It's a thick book. And it's it gets pretty uh, it gets pretty technical, but yes, I have read that. Uh, Sister Lynn says this makes sense and goes along with what I thought about Genesis one one and one two. Uh, please send me notes. I sure will, Sister. I'll get those out to you um, after we're um, off the air tonight. Um, I'll get those out to you. Thank you for asking for them. Uh, Sister Ann uh, chimes in here. She says I appreciate this study. But it's also quite challenging uh, since I've been taught and have believed young earth. Sure, uh, my mind needs to catch up. I'm sure I'll, I have questions. Uh, yes, and Brother Bob says, not sure if I follow all the thoughts of them, but very deep. That it is. That book is very, um, very, it goes into a lot of detail uh, about Noah's Ark and, and the flood is what it really talks about and a lot of science it's it's a very good book but yes very heavy read and uh, no I appreciate uh, Sister Ann uh, chiming in there because you know the vast majority of you know evangelical Christians have been taught and believe in young earth let me tell you something I don't claim to have the final word on this. I can teach what I believe the Bible teaches. Um, I, I, as we compare Scripture, um, you know, I, I, as we compare Scripture with Scripture, there and, and and one thing too that really opened my eyes is when I began doing the Hebrew studies because you know the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And when I began doing those Hebrew word studies, it began to open up vistas of understanding. But by all means, listen, our fellowship does not center upon what we believe about the age of the earth. I want to emphasize that, okay? My, uh, my brethren who teach the young earth creation are just that, my brothers and sisters, okay? And I am their brother, even though I teach something different than them. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. What unites us is our faith in Jesus. Amen. Not our understanding of creation, age of the earth, those matters. Those are interesting things to study. And really, these are in-house debates. We can, you know, go forth as believers and discuss these things. But... Uh, yeah, it certainly is not the basis of our fellowship. So I appreciate, uh, and I appreciate very much uh, you chiming in there and with your with your heart. Um, and and understand also. Let me say this: I'm not trying to uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to convert anyone. Okay, <laughs> praise the Lord. No, um, but you know I I think it is interesting to study. And it is just that. It is an interesting study. Thank God for this book. I mean, this is God's book. It, I mean, you can read it and read it and study it and study it and just, you know, grab new nuggets of truth all the time. Uh, it is awesome. So, amen. And Sister Lynn comments there and she says, Ann, I was where you are. And you know what? Um, when I first started studying the Bible, um, you know, I, I was well, first thing I was exposed to. <laughs> I'm a hard one to convert. She says, hey, praise the Lord. I appreciate someone who knows what they believe and stands by it. Amen. I do. So blessing, sister. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, uh, but I, I was, you know, I, I was exposed to the earth being, you know, 
six six to seven thousand years old and the uh, date of the creation being 4004 bc and by the way uh, we are also going to talk about where the 4004 bc number came from and you know how it was arrived at anyway we are out of time this week i just want to say may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you may the lord lift up his countenance and give you peace i bless you in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost blessed to be a blessing and i want to say these words and leave you with these words from first john chapter 5 and verse 4 whatever is born of god overcomes the world and this is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith blessings to you